Hello all. I'd like to say happy election day, but this is the most anxious and fearful election day I've ever experienced. It's definitely the most important election in my lifetime, and so far, and I suspect it will be one of, if not the most important election in the history of the United States. I have wrestled with how I need to participate in this, and I woke up this morning with a revelation that I needed to share a segment from my novel, The Kiva and the Mosque. I think it will speak for itself. Do know that there'll be a break uh, in reading this chapter because there's a spoiler section in it and it's not really relevant to the, uh, the subject at hand. Senator Laura Fletcher looked at the items on her desk like a detective studying clues. Two spiral-bound books, a letter, and a piece of pending health care legislation lay in a neat semicircle. Fluorescent post-it notes marked sections in each book, and the letter was worn from where it had been read and reread. The books were not professionally printed nor bound. Each cover held a simple title and nothing else. One was entitled The Book of Kidwell, and the other was The Book of Asia. She had read about the books and waves of emails from the New Age set included in her constituency. The senator had paid little heed. Assuming they were another crackpot trend, then she met Jeffers. Jeffers had been a part of her campaign team during the last election, and he was invited to one of her regular receptions arranged by her campaign professionals whenever she returned to her district. The man had changed. She returned to her district. Oh, the man had changed. She remembered him vaguely as part of the Putnam group. Senator Fletcher had never liked Reverend Putnam, but he had an uncanny ability to bring in the conservative vote, so she had attempted to keep relations cordial. She felt little grief when she lost Putnam's support after she abstained from a vote on legislation about partial birth abortion. In general, she agreed with the conservative stand on abortion, but she had heard convincing testimony from physicians about the rare and real medical need for partial birth abortion. Opponents of the practice made it sound as though it were a method of birth control. It was not. Case examples included rare instances when mothers carried partial, partially formed fetuses full term if medical intervention did not terminate the pregnancy. This could be extremely hazardous to the mother. She remembered one particularly moving testimony from a mother who carried a fetus that never developed a brain. The family was poor and had not sought medical care from a public clinic until well into the pregnancy. Once she learned that the fetus within her was not fully human, not fully a baby, the woman was forced to carry the fetus another four weeks before medical professionals were able to jump through all the legal hoops necessary for her to receive a late-term abortion. Besides the physical risk, it was hard to predict when the fetus would become dead tissue. It was mental and emotional agony. The woman and her husband spent four weeks mourning the death of a child that she still carried within her. Laura was a hardened legislator, having spent eight years as a state congresswoman before seeking national office, but she still lay awake at night, wrestling with her opposition to abortion and her memory of the weeping face of that still mourning mother. She had abstained. It was the best answer she could find. The rapid letters she had received from Putnam and others of his ilk had not only lost her many conservative votes, but also expressed damnation for her eternal soul. On a personal level, Laura felt relief to finally be rid of the need to appease such adamant radicals. On a professional level, she feared for her political life. Because of his association with Putnam, Jeffers had triggered real fear for the senator when she saw the man standing in line at the reception for her political supporters. She looked anxiously at the books he carried and secretly wondered how easy it would be to disguise a bomb as a book. The senator swallowed her fear and greeted the young man with a large smile and a warm handshake. This is where the skip is. It's a spoiler. And I'm hoping you want to read the book. I'm going to skip ahead. And she mentions the books that he gives to her. Picking up that same book, it's the book of Kidwell. The senator turned a page to a passage she had tagged with a post-it and marked it in ink. She read it again. We're still at a loss as to what to do with the pilgrims who find their way to our hideaway. 
They are supposed to be here, or the guardians would not allow them to find the place, but I am frightened when they look to me with worship in their eyes. I'm a stumbling bum just trying to find my own way. My friend and ally, Asia, gave me the answer. The revelation came not from a session with her spirit guides, it came from her years as an art teacher. She deals well with the pilgrims, they ask her for answers, and instead she asks questions, guiding their minds, hearts, and souls to find their own solutions. Watching her helped me find an answer of my own. Spiritual growth isn't a science, it's an art. An art teacher could teach a student to draw a line this way, give formulas to mix colors, and provide paint-by-number pictures to re reproduce exactly. But the end product would be something less than art. And the student would have learned nothing but to regurgitate what, this, what the teacher gave them. The soul is one amazing canvas. And no one can paint the art truly waiting there but the person entrusted with that canvas. Those willing to give answers and striving to stifle questions that take people outside the box of their answers have corrupted our world. They want them to believe. Is there any great, any truly massive evil committed in the history of humanity that did not have its origins? And self-serving individuals that did not have, oh, excuse me, that did not have its origins in self-serving individuals who disguise their own wishes as the voice of God. What's more, the lies they create outlive the people who create them. This can only happen when enough people hand over the canvas of their soul to the hands of painters who disguise the true nature of what it is they wish to create. Aisha and I are working together and separately to pass on something that's been given to us. As you read these pages, never forget that it is simply a description of my journey, not a road map for your own. It is a step of faith, giving up the need to know what is right for anyone but yourself. The mosaic of humanity is complex. I believe, it may or may not be true for you, that when I find myself in opposition to another, we may both be right. Even if I must oppose them, I cannot judge them. Their canvas is their own to paint, not mine. The senator glanced at the Book of Asia. She found the passages almost as beautiful as the color templates of the author's art mixed in the pages, but it did not speak to her as strongly as the Book of Kidwell. Perhaps it was because the senator came from a Christian background, and his kid, as did Kidwell. Although she could not understand them, the senator rejoiced at the passages in Arabic mixed with the pages in English. It gave her hope. Perhaps Asia's message would touch more of the world. Next was the letter from Constituent. She received hundreds, but this one had caught her by the throat and held her. Her staff had laid the letter on, to, on her desk, along with a dozen others, because it dealt with health care, one of the crucial subjects currently under debate. The letter was simple. Written in the broad hand of a woman unaccustomed to the use of the, the word and word, with English obviously her second language. She was the widow of a migrant farm worker, a man who had made his living, raised his children, and lived his life harvesting onions and potatoes. He had died of pneumonia. Death came in the bedroom of a hum humble migrant shack. No hospital would take him. They had not lived in the, country, in the country long enough to qualify for indigent care. At the emergency room a week before, the doctors had decided the husband could make the trip back to their permanent residence for care. The woman did not have the courage to tell them that they had no way of making that journey. Their eldest son had hitchhiked 500 miles to be by her side. He was at the hospital fighting to have his father admitted, while the man simply drifted away, nestled in the arms of his wife. Tears welled in the eyes of the hardened legislator. She felt powerless at the turn of events in the current health care debate. Champions for various lobbying groups primarily pharmaceutical companies and health services, dominated the discussion. AARP was making some good points for elder care, but no one was being paid to speak for the indigent. No lobbyist had a high-paying expense account to use on their behalf. No group had the funds for the huge campaign donations so necessary for re-election. The senator knew that she played the game, just as they all did. It had become a necessary evil, but the process sickened her made it impossible co to commit herself fully to serving the people, as she had dreamed when she was a young idealist. The senator leaned back in her chair and closed her eyes. What can I do? She said to no one in particular. 
I had a dream, a voice said from across her desk. The senator opened her eyes and looked directly at Martin Luther King, Jr. He sat in the chair across from her. She fought to breathe. Dr. King, I did not live, live to see my dream come to life, but I had a dream, and I shared that dream. What are you saying? Woman, name me your dream, Dr. King said. The senator thought, I dream that we can create legislation that means no one must die because I can't afford health care. Dr. King laughed. His eyes softened as he looked at the woman. That's not a dream. That's a goal. Name me your dream. The senator closed her eyes, looking deep within her heart, searching for the dream. Tears streamed down her cheeks, pain and joy mixed as she dug within the storage closet of her chest and dusted off old thoughts and hopes. I dream. I dream of a time when the decisions of the nation will be made of the people, for the people, and by the people. The king smiled. That, my friend, is a dream. He leaned forward and tapped the pending legislation on her desk. Start here, but you keep your focus on the dream. The civil rights legend stood, turned, and walked with purpose toward the closed door where he simply disappeared. The senator looked first at the desk plate. Don't forget to listen. She looked then at the legislation before her. No lobbyist had approached her to speak for the indigent. She would anyway. Re-election be damned. She would do her job.